Welcome, guys, to another episode of Catch the Curious, where we break down those that are thriving in their profession. On today's episode, we have Mr. Jason Chan, restaurateur, cancer survivor, martial arts instructor. Help me co-host Jason as a former employee of, of Jason's. Could you, was that, is that accurate? I don't, I don't it's not accurate. Team, she team was, member. She was, we worked together. Oh, I like that. I like <laughs> I that. I like that, too. Yeah. Olia Sauter, former EMT student, and you can find her slinging drinks at Flight Club. Absolutely. All right, so welcome, guys. Thank you. Got some coffee in hand. Great to be here. Um, let's start with how long you've, can you, in your own words, kind of define what a restaurant tour and weirdly it doesn't have an N in it, right? So restaurant yeah. tour, um, what, is, what, are the, what is it to you and, and how long you've been doing it for? Oh, it's funny you should ask that. Yeah. Because uh, restaurant tour and restaurant come from the same French word and uh, it literally, um, restaurants were invented literally in 1750 okay. in Paris, France. And okay. The word restaurant and the word restaurateur means restorative, mm. a place one would go to for uh, a restorative, actually at the time was a, a consomme. Okay. So the first restaurant, this was after the war, uh, a lot of private chefs and service help uh, that lived in these residences after the war, they found themselves without jobs, so a lot of private chefs, in particular two uh, brothers, decided to open a little stand in a square in Paris, and uh, what they did is they sweated, or they braised a bunch of uh, meats and vegetables into consomme, hmm. and it was set up as a stall or a stand where people at the time, mostly female uh, customers, could go to because at the time everything was revolved around your digestive tract and your system, all the maladies and all the illnesses oh, yeah, you got, yeah, yeah. everything you contracted sure. was because of your a sensitive uh, dietary tract. Okay, so what they did is they built up, the, they developed this restorative salon where people could go to oh. and purchase these consommes. So that was actually the first restaurant. It was called a, I believe it was called a restaurant salon. <laughs> de salon. And they dropped a de salon and then they added other items like uh, uh, salmon and pastries and other things. Sure, and so sure. restaurateur and uh, restaurant come from that word. And for me, uh, being a restaurateur means uh, being in the most competitive business with the highest failure rate mm -hmm. uh, and parallel to that uh, the business with the highest overhead and the smallest profit margin so really being a restaurateur to me means uh, wearing about eight different hats because you have to be an accountant you have to be mm. a uh, graphic designer you have to be a PR person a marketing person you have to be a plumber uh, you also have to consequently know uh, and have have done all the roles that uh, are in a restaurant. So you, right. I was a bartender. I was a bar bank, right. I was a busboy. I was a dishwasher. I was a waiter. I've I was a food runner. I've yeah. literally I was a chef thirty years ago. So uh, I've literally done everything in a restaurant uh, that one can do in a restaurant. You were kind of born into it. I was. I've, it's literally in my blood. It's hereditary. My both my mother and my father were in the restaurant business. Yeah. Even though they told you not to, they even gave you, yeah. you know, menial tasks to do like clean every little nook sure. and cranny on the weekends and get paid five dollars for it every yeah day. exactly you know the story right. um but you know you tell any eight-year-old kid nowadays or 45 years ago you tell an eight-year-old kid not to do something and that's exactly right. what they want to do and i'm right. i'm guilty of that because i also think that any entrepreneur but especially a restaurateur uh has a very i would say a rebellious or a divine kind of uh, yeah. mentality about themselves right. otherwise we'd all work in an office or do a nine-to-five that quote-unquote normal people would do right <laughs> right, the right, day right, right because right. they have yeah like the day walkers exactly she's yeah the civilians yes <laughs> <laughs> um and as much as they didn't want you to do it they kept having one foot in right so they, they had an art shop well, Asian. so my parents, you know, everything culminated to a moment where my parents really taught me one of the things that, and as Aaliyah knows, is I don't, <clears throat> I really don't ever try to preach or execute anything from opinion. It's always by example. That's the way I manage. Uh, that's the way I run the business is that, you know, I'm pretty much hands-on. I like engaging with uh, mainline, right, to the guests as much as the bartenders, the servers, mm -hmm. the hosts do. Mm -hmm. um, so my parents really taught me a very valuable lesson early in life uh, that they said, okay, well, they're scratching their head. They said, well, we can tell him 
that we want him to be a doctor. We can tell him that we want him to be a lawyer or an attorney or that we didn't work so hard that immigrate to this country uh, to provide a better life for you uh, and then have you be in the restaurant business. Um, but they were really happy. They had a thriving, you know, my parents, if you think about it back in the late 60s uh, to the mid 70s when they opened all their restaurants and bars, my parents owned and operated an Irish pub. Yeah a Jewish deli, and a Greek coffee shop. Wow. And so you have these two <laughs> four foot five uh, Asian immigrants who barely speak the language. My mom was a chef. My dad was the bartender Bart- yeah, and manager. Right, right. Um, and he's, you know, he was an accountant back in Hong Kong, so he did the books as well. Um, I had my two Asian parents uh, thriving in Andersonville at an Irish pub. Uh, Lincoln Park, uh, they own a Jewish deli, and Michigan and Wacker, uh, very close to where wow. Aaliyah works. Quite My good, parents yeah. owned a coffee shop that they bought from Pete Cyanus, uh, who owned Billy Go Tavern, and mm. he owned a coffee. His brother owned a coffee shop at three 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 Wacker. Wow! And so that's that's I I was. That's what, where I was a short order cook for my parents. <laughs> where do you where do you think how did they thrive? I mean most most traditional immigrants keep to themselves, right? They they shy away Absolutely. from from Western, you know, culture. So what what about that neighborhood, Andersonville or whatever other neighborhood they were in, what what appealed to them? What did they it was or do they just love rising to the challenge well, or what was it? I don't know what uh, demographic oops, excuse you're me, good, you're which good. demographic this is gonna appeal to, but I'm use some graphic language yeah please do colorful they they had balls (laughs) big balls my parents have always again i think the common denominator that certainly trickled down to my dna is uh they had that spark that entrepreneurial rebellious uh what i like to well what they technically now call uh innovative uh disruption disruptive innovation like at the time there was all these old school uh, Irish pubs in mm-hmm. Chicago. Andersonville, uh, which not a lot of people know, started out as a Swedish neighborhood, but then quickly became a very white Irish Catholic mm. neighborhood. St. Gregory Church. Mm-hmm. Uh, my parents uh, were a block, two blocks away from Temple Steel, which was all Irish uh, steel workers. Mm-hmm. Across the street from St. Gregory Church in high school, uh, I lived next door to the chief of police whose name was Richard Tracy, and on the other side of my house was the chief, the fire police, uh, the fire department chief, really? uh, Tim Garrity. Okay. And I lived next to the McMillans, the McMahons, oh, the man. Nees, uh, <laughs> the, the McGordys, the McGillicuddies. It was all Irish. And what my parents really did is they honed in on something that I honed in on, and I think uh, Aaliyah can uh, attest to this, is that you're absolutely right. Normally when you're any um, ethnicity and you go to another, you emigrate from your homeland country to the United States, your buffer or your segue or your stepping stone into the American culture is to, okay, we're Chinese, let's move into Chinatown. Because we don't have to learn language right away. We can speak to other Chinese people. Mm-hmm. We have all of our cultural um, cuisine mm-hmm. within a block or two radius. Uh, so it makes it really easy to assimilate to the United right. States. Um my parents, uh, not my mom, because my mom's like the Mike Tyson of Korean moms. My stepfather, who was emigra- immigrated here from Hong Kong, went to Canada first. There was a big community in Chinese community okay. in Toronto. So he was there for about a year. And then, uh, don't tell Trump this, but both my parents forged their passports and everything. <laughs> 45 years ago because they could there was no hologram it was all signatures and yeah. it was tight so yeah. they both you know came into this country illegally wow. essentially and then found a means in a way after they were in the workforce here and started paying and, taxes and right, voted and right. all that then uh, they became contributing members of, uh, of society and then they retroactively found the legal way to stay here mm-hmm. and that being said my parents went the opposite direction rather than hide in the comfort zone of Koreatown uh, at the time, which was by Lawrence and Kimball, uh, or Chinatown, uh, my parents said, listen, there's a universal language. It's usually uh, food mm. and music. Those two things usually bridge uh, the culture gap between yeah. any two cultures, right? So my parents 
said, hey, even though we don't know the language, and uh, my mom's like, I'm a, you know, I know how to cook Korean food. Uh, what do I know about uh, summer sausage sandwiches and corned beef and cabbage? <laughs> and but there were recipes, yeah. and the owners of the Irish pub showed my mom. They owned the they owned the pub. It was called McPartland's Pub, and uh, the woman uh, spent a lot of time teaching my mom all the recipes. My mom uh, honored those recipes and. You know, the integrity and the brand that the former owners had built, and they wanted to capitalize on that, of course. But they did, again, I can only imagine the conversations they had at night between each other, like, you're Chinese, I'm Korean. We just <laughs> bought an Irish pub that was 40 years old. It's yeah. crazy busy. We're going to go broke. Right. Like, I could imagine just the emotional stress, the financial stress, and just the things they must have worried about. Right. But it was a huge Payoff, yeah. uh, it was a it was a crazy crazy hit. My parents were busy for the minute they opened at eleven thirty uh, until two a.m. every day for eleven years. They were people jam people, loved- people didn't just embrace them. They it's my retirement uh, concept. Uh, it was an Irish pub. Right. My mom had hired all the attractive, hot Asian cocktail waitresses, waitresses and hostesses from Contiki Ports. Huh. Uh, House of Aang, the Playboy Club. My my mom worked was a waitress at the Playboy Club. Oh no way! Um, uh, Trader Vic's, Contiki Ports was the uh, Tony hot uh, in place uh, on Michigan Avenue at the Sheridan Hotel in the mm. townhouse. So she brought all these Asian uh, waitresses and cocktail waitresses. Uh, she cooked all the food, but every day my mom would have one Asian special that right, she would put on the right. menu. So there was corned beef and cabbage on Sunday. There yeah. was uh, f- fried perch right from Lake Michigan on Friday. There was spaghetti, homemade spaghetti on Wednesday, cheeseburgers on, on uh, Tuesday. And every day, you know, there was this full menu, daily specials, but then my mom would make a Asian specialty. Oh, and right. so it, the place was up for grabs every night. It was four deep at the bar busy from open to close uh it was it was crazy it was also at the height of you know my parents took this bar over in 1971 so from 71 to literally 83 yeah. my parents i i can't even thrive isn't a big enough word they were wow. balls to the wall every day well i want it was pretty risky though putting corned beef and kimchi yeah, but people, <laughs> exactly. People dug, you know. Well, they, look at all the restaurants now, like Kimsky and yeah, uh, yeah. Pasarotto and and Parachute. Uh, Even though the Mexican, uh, the, the the Korean Mexican joints. Sure. Yeah. Like the I sushi have a, burritos. Yeah, yeah, yeah those exactly. you know. Yeah. I'm saving my Korean hybrid concept. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm letting all these other people open there. I'm an open mind. You're, you're doing your. Blow you're, everybody you're right. out of the water. <laughs> So they were kind of the, one of like the first pioneers then of the oh absolutely the because it bridges scene. exactly because you know food and music bridge every culture there is right. it's probably the only thing that's synonymous and, and a common denominator with every culture okay. whether you're young old uh, or any race or religion food is what defines a culture yes and if you go to another country she's going to be traveling soon and going to another uh, continent and the first thing you really do to kind of get an idea or grasp on where you're at is the food right you know what what defines this culture what is their you know what are they known for what's the what's the dish that defines uh you know belgium what's the what's the dish that defines korea uh so my parents really thrived on one thing and one premise which was hospitality it kind of is a universal language Mm -hmm. so it's not what you say because they didn't know a lot of English, but it was the way they uh, took care of people. Mm. And it, that spoke to people. They're, all their guests and all their customers felt the way. They felt it in my mom's food. They felt it in my dad's uh, hospitality yeah. and service style because it is it is very Asian. It's very subservient. It's very gracious. It's very, uh, you, you feel it. Yeah. You, he, he projects it. Uh, my dad... Uh, I get a lot of my inspirational, motivational, uh, how do I say, DNA from my father. Okay. I get uh, the fiery side, spicy side from, from my mom. mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they had big balls. Huge. Um, but they still wanted you to take the traditional, like, educational route. Yeah. Could they not really, they didn't, I mean, how about these days? Have they, like, oh, Jason made it on his own, like, he did his, carved his own path. and? I don't want to, we could speak 
we could do 20 shows on that. So okay. I, I, okay. I know I'm very long winded, so I'm going to keep it as short as I yeah. can. Yeah. There's one defining story that, des- that describes my mom and my dad and how they feel about me and my career choice because I'm a bad Korean. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer. I didn't marry a Korean girl at 22 years old and have okay. grandkids by now. Oh, wow. M- me having grandkids by now. I've got tattoos and. Uh, so, <clears throat> the the one defining thing that kind of describes, especially my mom, my mother, but both my parents, is that um, it was uh, 2014. I just got uh, I just got nominated uh, restaurant tour of the year by the Chicago Tribune. My restaurant Juno, which was my sushi restaurant, was uh, Time Out. Just voted it uh, top five sushi restaurants mm-hmm. in the country. Uh, I was also on the heels of this article that came out in Huffington Post and the Daily Mail about uh, a situation that happened in my restaurant. So there's all this media, there's all this attention on my restaurant and the achievements that I was uh, uh, accruing there. And I'll never forget, it was October 18th, and my mom had come in uh, with my aunt and her girlfriend, her best friend, and my father, and they were doing omakase and having a a Mm. birthday dinner. And uh, I had the... We had a TV on, and uh, I was being featured on the TV. Oh, no way. Uh, people in the restaurant were walking up to me as I was standing next to my parents' uh, table saying, oh, we read the article today, and we wanted to come into the restaurant to see you, and it was a picture of me uh, on the cover of the newspaper for Restaurant Tour of the Year. And uh, my aunt and my uh, my, mom, my mom's best friend, her best girlfriend, looked at my mom and said, aren't, aren't you proud of your 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 son and as you know being of asian descent uh let's just say asian parents uh aren't exactly warm and fuzzy and don't exactly uh show emotion. express yeah, and, and tell you to your, they'll tell everybody in the world when you're not around oh, i'm so proud of them they'll <sighs> brag about you oh my son's this my son's that but to your face you know they'll never it's uh, it's, it's humbling you, right I yeah guess. exactly yeah, it, yeah. it's to keep you always that you can never do uh, too well. You always have to try to do better. Sure. And I think that's why they do it, right? It's like a plant that starves for water. Yeah. Like, they keep you... They but just isn't that you a interesting? Like, you, you want to live your life, but you want to make your parents proud. Well, so they said, aren't you proud? And for the first time, <laughs> I'm, I'm 49 years old at the time, or 48 years old at the time, and my mom looks up from her seat, and she puts her hand on my face. She's like, I'm very proud of you. I'm oh, so proud. man. And I... I was in shock. And I, I, like, look, I got goosebumps. Talk, I got goosebumps talking about it right now. It's the first time in my life. I'm 48 year old man, and and I'm like, my mom just told me she's fucking proud of me. And my dad is kind of like, what? And my my aunt and my mom's best friend are like, you know, they're like almost crying. And then she's like, I'm so proud of you. She's like, um, this is all great, and uh, that's why now you should go back to school and be a chiropractor okay it's not too late you're not 50 yet you can still go to school and be a chiropractor mm. and now that you've achieved this i'm like okay now the goosebumps are my <laughs> and so so that's what i mean like my is is it any great thing that i could ever do in my life and i'm so blessed and lucky and fortunate that i've not only had the opportunity to achieve a lot of great things but i I have fulfilled a lot of great things in my life. Uh, as long as my mom's alive and as long as I'm alive, she'll always, it's weird. It's not pushing me to do better, but she'll always want, expect me to do better, which falls yeah. back into that Asian stereotype of the tiger mom. You know, I'm eight years old at my desk and she walks in, are you a doctor yet? I'm like, no, I'm eight years old. She closes the door. <laughs> right? I, I would have expected otherwise. You know, because, you know, ultimately they want us to be independent and and thrive and be able to provide for friends and family and whatnot. Um, and in their generation, perhaps the more traditional route, like going to law school, engineering or med school, was that definition. But even after seeing that success, like that didn't change her perspective of what success could have been. No, I, and here's why. Because uh, going back to the topic earlier about my parents' uh leading by uh, example instead of opinion. They said, you know, as much as we want him 
uh, to be all these great things better than what we were. Here we are, happy, thriving, making tons of money and making lots and hundreds and hundreds of people a day happy. And uh, not only is it a livelihood, we're, we're crushing it. We're really providing a more than a, a better life for ourselves. Um, my parents decided, well, we got to sell the bar. We got to sell the restaurants uh, and the coffee shop and we got to do something and show our son, because uh, I'm an only child, show him by example that, okay, uh, if we can do it, then you can do it. So then my parents literally uh, at the time, I think they probably were in their late 30s, walked away from cash every day, three businesses, cash flow, investments, uh, the whole nine yards. Uh, they own real estate. They're like, fuck it. Let's just, let's try something new. Mm -hmm. So my parents signed a 25 year lease on Michigan Avenue. Uh, in a galleria of retail shops, which is now Nordstrom's. Oh. Before it was Nordstrom's, oh, wow. it was Marriott's galleria of shops. Oh, wow. And my parents, uh, my mom and dad struck deals with import exporters from Korea, Japan, and China and opened up a uh, handicraft um, kind of like a trading post. Mm -hmm. So they had... For lack of a better word, they had a gallery of like fine Asian art, um, paintings, artwork, furniture, decor, and then like kind of like a world market. As a consumer that was but staying like, in the the, yeah. the Marriott Hotel, you could come in and say, "Oh, I need that little tchotchke to take back to my wife in New York," or you could say, oh, "Hey, I want to order. Uh, I'm a designer. I'm in town for the the design convention, and I want to buy uh, wherever that factory or that art." Uh, factory is in China that made uh, that piece of ivory and those, you know, those immaculate uh, pieces of furniture. I want to order yeah. all those and have them shipped to wow. my client, wherever. So my parents did that for 25 years. Okay. Yeah, and they crushed it. But then they retired when their lease was up after 25 years. Uh, they decided to retire and move to North Carolina so that my mom could golf uh, <laughs> every day. Whoa. But uh, cool. yeah, two things two things <laughs> happened. Uh, two things happened. Uh, they were retired for all of maybe forty five days before they went nuts, and they bought a burger franchise in Charlotte. And my mom was flipping burgers, and my dad was working the counter. <laughs> <clears throat> and then I got married, and they assumed, "Holy crap, he finally did it! He's thirty eight years old. He got married." Let's pack up and move back to Chicago because okay. he's going to have a mess of kids and I'm going to be babysitting and, and taking kids to the park. And so they move back to Chicago and then I got divorced. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> a year later. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a huge, I'm a bad Korean. I'm a huge disappointed. Okay. Man. <laughs> you're, you're carving your own path. That's what you're doing. That's exactly what I'm doing. That's what you're doing. I'm a one-off. Um, Yeah. So, but during, as a child... You would always kind of sneak downstairs and and kind of watch what your what what your parents were doing. Absolutely. And and then when they were when people weren't around, you would pretend. You would pretend to be behind the bar, or pretend to to cook and whatnot. Yeah. So what? And you you actually went to culinary school, right? So no, I did not. I lied to my parents. Oh, that was a lie. Yeah, I lied to my parents and I apprenticed at the Les Cargo. Les Cargo. That's in the what it was. Hotel. Okay. Yeah, because back then. Uh, no one hired the equivalent right now is her and I interviewing someone and say, oh, I went to bartending school. Ugh. Oh, great. You wouldn't, you would never hire someone <laughs> from bartending audible? school, right? <laughs> um, back then, no one would hire anybody uh, at a restaurant to be a cook. You okay. Had to, you, I would, hey, you worked for Victor Chan for for four years as his line cook, sous chef, chef oh, de partie, okay, or okay. Grand Marge, whatever station it was you worked and worked your way up to uh, until you became sous chef. Uh, then you would then you could say okay I'm gonna go to any restaurant now and 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 apply for a job because I apprenticed with a certain chef so that was the path that I was certainly following so I uh, did that for two years and then I went into the front of the house I started waiting because I need to make money I was so making can three, you, can three dollars and five cents re an hour retell that story when you were at your your buddy's house the bus boy's house yeah I. Uh, Les Cargo had a Christmas party. Yeah. I was there for uh, six months, uh, a year and six months. And I went to a Christmas party. It was a staff Christmas party. And it was uh, 
a waiter who lived uh, by Addison and Halstead. Okay. Him and his husband had a Christmas party, and I, I went with one of the busboys who was my buddy. We used to smoke a <laughs> lot of pot together, and uh, I go to the party, and there it, I was – gobsmacked i walked in and this apartment was like nicer than any apartment i'd ever seen uh there was a long table with like chafing dishes and all this food there's another table with champagne and wine and spirits and everything you can imagine to drink and then there's a dessert table and then at the end of the dessert table there's a tray with a big pile of sugar and a bowl and i was like oh jeez, what is i don't get that and the bus isaac my friend who was the bus was like that's cocaine and i was like what i'm like that i go how much cocaine is that he's like it's all shit ton i'm like yeah well i can see that how much do you think that costs he's like i don't know two thousand dollars maybe oh, gosh. and i looked at him and i said well uh, you know i've been in the kitchen for the last year and a half i make three dollars and five cents an hour uh i made four hundred dollars pre-tax every two weeks wow um and so I scratched my head and I said, well, how much did these guys make a night? And this is 1984. Hmm. So you have to understand the, uh, you have to understand the, the rate of, uh, at the time, what the was, income. Was there, what was minimum wage? It was $3.05. Huh. So the waiters are making two to $300 a night. What? And I, th- I started crying. I'm a crier. <laughs> I started crying. And I said, wait a minute. What they make in a... F- Friday or Saturday night, or in the, both those nights is what I essentially make in two weeks. And I, you have to understand, back then, <clears throat> and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus because everybody sure. from my era at that time, I worked probably 12 to 16 hours a day, but I only got paid eight because that you were apprenticing. I, yeah, so that was I the it. that was a price you paid, not getting paid for the extra four to six hours because I had one. I had the best. I had the the only four star French chef in Chicago. Okay. Uh, teaching me how to uh, make sauces and teaching me how to work in a kitchen, teaching mm-hmm. me how to plate desserts. And, you know, I started out at pantry, working mm-hmm. in Grand Marger, just making salads and, and plating desserts, which at the time was nothing. You, you know, you just put the, the garnish and you put the dish on the plate. And then you move up and they teach, you how to, they teach you how to burn pans and they teach you how to make sauces. And so I was on a track. But unlike most people uh, in the culinary profession, in the back of the house, uh, no matter what happens, you, you, you stay on course and you, you do whatever you have to do. But for me, uh, I've quickly realized that my forte and what I was really good at was engaging with people, Interesting. engaging with guests, uh, not stuck back in the kitchen with my head down. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask if, if money wasn't an issue, if you would have stuck around in the back. Uh shy of yeah. uh trying to supply that bowl of sugar to the <laughs> server that i went to uh for the party that would have been the only other option <laughs> i wouldn't have had to work uh but yeah that's i you know i think passion points to a purpose i've always there's always been a passion for me and good or bad or ugly uh or whatever possession position it is like you know i want to make a jump into the hotel business because mm. it's still hospitality it's not food and bedrest based so much but it's still hospitality so at 53 years old now you know i've kind of hit a existential moment of crisis in my life or a midlife crisis but as not in life but as it pertains to my profession i've been doing this for 35 years Mm. so i said what do i want to do for the next 20 25 years can i and she knows this can i kiss babies and shake hands and make everybody feel warm and fuzzy when they come into a dining room and be on my feet in a suit uh you know uh being the face of a place absolutely uh i have endless and boundless energy to do that because it's my nature and who i am and it's part of what i love to do Mm -hmm. but i think now i'm at a point in my life where i want to do what i want to do instead of what i have to do and i've always had that mentality which is why i got in the restaurant right 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 so at this juncture it's like okay what do i do next i'm gonna try to do some things where i pull the strings and i'm like a lot of other chefs and operators, I'm going to try to be hands off and uh, do more execution, getting it set up, but then hiring and placing the right people uh, mm. consulting with then. me. Right. Well, consulting and then also, you know, I started my own group, my right. own hospitality group. I've done consulting for the last 10 months and opened two restaurants, but the next phase for me is to go into 
a property uh, like a food hall or a hotel lobby or something of that nature, an office building, and do a very small uh, kiosk or stand oh. uh, that does QSR, quick service, or fast food or casual fast food, um, and start off with that because I want to kind of well, I want to make money. <laughs> yeah, at the end of the day, uh, yeah, <laughs> and really. Right now, with all the things that are looming in the near future for Chicago, but uh, the country as a whole, like there definitely is some sort of recession. If there isn't, there's a fear of recession where it's going to pull back uh, the purse strings on a lot of the consumers. And so I want to do something that's more in the lines of like big star. Uh, quick, yeah. Uh, just uh, quality quick. Yeah. Under 15 bucks, mm -hmm. quality comfort food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you both can kind of answer this question, but when kind of Bernie said that you have a template when setting up shops, yeah. but when, when clients um, come in, not clients, but like customers, customers and clients, um, when they come in at the front of the house, you're everyone from the waiters, the bus boys, the hostess, even the operator, you're a face, you're, you're the face of their home. This is your home, essentially. You're welcoming people into your home. So how do you create an immersive experience? Because I, I, I have a feeling that that's what you're trying to create, not just a place to eat, right? So what goes through you your go, head? You can go anywhere to right? eat, really. Yeah. I remember so, Jason would ticket. always kind of talk about that people can go get food anywhere. Mm. It's not they'll remember good food, they'll, they'll go back for that food, but what they really remember is the experience going in. Mm -hmm. um, so whether it is the bartender or the bus or whoever they are interacting with, every positive interaction and like if they if you remember someone coming in for the second time or if you just kind of go out of your way to go that extra step of like recommending something that you think that they would really like or giving like a free little sample right. of a wine or something they remember that and they come back for you not for the food and that's what mm. jason has been so good at and it's been fun watching him when we did work together was just all these people that would keep coming back to see to see him and to see the 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 venue and kind of the whole um, experience that goes with it and not just the the food itself yeah there's there's a pulse almost and it's palpable absolutely now how do you go about finding um co-workers that thrive and care as much as you care <clears throat> well i'll answer the first question and this uh, yeah. the latter um ali's a great example because mm -hmm. she was the first person i hired Oh, Literally. wow. Oh. And I never, <clears throat> like a lot of, and it's no big secret because I'm not doing anything that is is uh, groundbreaking or, or breaking the mold or innovative and new. I rarely ever go, you know, a resume is what gets you in front of a person. But then once that person's in front of you, you kind of have to, you, get, you have to feel, like you said, it, it, it's, a, there's something inherent in people. I call it the dysfunctional gene. She has it, I have it. Most that dysfunctional industries. that dysfunctional gene is really what makes you a lot of money and here's here's what it is that dysfunctional gene is the desire and need the inherent can't be taught that you get more pleasure that you love pleasing people and you get more pleasure from pleasing other people sometimes even more than yourself mm -hmm. um, for the ones that really do it on a high level you're almost selfless like you only get pleasure when you see other people uh, happy. happy yeah and for me she knows this and I I practice what I preach uh, I care more about first is uh, my staff they're my product so regardless of the restaurant that I open I can't I know through my parents what I like again it was ingrained in me because I learned it from inception at eight years old that you're only as good as the people to help you around you mm -hmm. uh, you can only be carried success on the shoulders of other people there isn't one single person not Michael Jordan uh, not uh, anybody that's achieved any great thing in their life has ever gotten there by themselves. Mm -hmm. There is always people behind the uh, in the background. There's people that weren't on TV. There's always people, you know, whether it was coaches and teachers. And uh, so I really, I really believe that it's one of the things that I project. And when I'm sitting in front of someone, you get a feeling, mm -hmm. and usually that feeling uh, is a projection of energy. And I usually go off that. And then you kind of ask the right questions because it's not who you hire, it's it's how you hire. Oh. And I like to, for me, it's like moth to flame. Like why do moths uh, attract themselves to a flame? Is it because it's a bright light and it's a conditioned response? No, because it's warmth. 
So I kind of try to pick up on an energy that's own warmth. Like, are we attracting each other because I'm a light and she's a light and we both see that light? Absolutely. Um, so for me, I think you really have to read a person's energy and what you spoke on earlier about it being palpable. Yeah, like, here's the thing. It, what can't be taught is that everybody can forget what they ate, what they drank. Everybody can forget the dining room that they saw, but they'll never, ever forget the way you made them feel. Mm. And so my parents, that's all they did. It was all about making people, like my mom's food made people a certain way. My dad's demeanor and all the uh, cocktail waiters and servers that were all these Asian, subservient, really Midwestern, drippy, syrupy service. Like it was, came from a genuine integrity place. Right, right. And right now, and especially in our industry, the greatest thing is, is that nine out of 10 places give you service. It's what happens to you one out of 10 places and hopefully a lot of places that I'm at, what I try to motivate the other people that work with me is it's what happens for people, not to them. Cause everybody has, you know, McDonald's, everybody walks in, something happens to them. Yeah. Would you like fries with that? That's something that happens to you. Oh, Hey Aaliyah, how are you? Thanks for coming back. I know you love fries. Do you mm. want, would you like an order of fries with this? I already made a fresh batch. So it's what happens mm -hmm. for you. So if you, you know, you really, uh, have to go into this there's an i call it emotional uh intelligence you're right yeah you you have to kind of get everybody on the same page to have that emotional intelligence because she knows as well as i do especially being a bartender i was a bartender for seven years at a high volume place she's uh been a bartender ever and in a lot of high volume and it's uh when it gets to the point where you're not smiling and there's a bead of sweat and you're making this face <laughs> because you got seven people talking to you and your bar backs off somewhere uh, yeah. vaping. And uh, you've got 10 people in front of you and all, like, yeah, I love what I do, but do I really love it right now? And so yeah. you've got to constantly, uh, you've got to connect with them on an, on an emotional level and say, hey, I know you're you're pretty you know you're spinning your wheels right now and it's you know balls to the wall but you know what can i do for you how can mm. i help you who do i need to send to help you what do you need so as an operator you're never too good to like you like like clean the toilets or scrub or mop or help with the bar uh, bag or anything like I, that. as i said many many times in many interviews yeah you're you're really only as an as an operator yeah you're more of a plumber handyman fix it guy than you are an actual restaurant tour okay but in speaking in terms on the subject, as it were, about the uh, about this recent um, of what you brought up, like it's really again, uh, I'm only as good as the people that help me get there. So you have to treat the and I do. I treat the dishwasher and the bartender uh, maybe even better than I do the chef because they're all nuts. <laughs> Stick them back in the hole. <laughs> they, should, they should be down here. <laughs> I remember that from when we did work together was what, like having everyone feel like they were part of a family and part of a nice team, really having that support behind you helps you even be even better towards the guests. Yeah. Um, because if something does go wrong, a lot of restaurants, the managers kind of throw you out and say like, oh, this, this happened with this guest. They were unhappy. It's your fault. Like they blame you for certain things rather than kind of back up the staff and say, what can we do? to not have that happen okay. again, where Jason always had the, the the staff's back, which then made us better to be with the guests. So it was right. kind of like this ripple effect with everyone. And like he said, like, do you talk to everyone the same? Like we were all like one big family and, and the way that he would hire people wasn't like he, for the experience. Like he said, it was the feeling that he got about someone. I think it's carried over a lot of service industry people kind of have that, um, characteristic outside of work as well when you're able to like go out and you you instantly get to know someone because you're just having these quick one two minute conversations with hundreds of people all day long so right. when you go out into your normal life with your friends with your family it's kind of the same way like you're able it to read over. people a lot better okay. and i think it is kind of a higher emotional intelligence like like he was saying so it just kind of pertain goes way past what yeah. it would be just Some, in. someone can have the technical skills that you're probably looking for and then some but if they lack the emotional intelligence right it's... you know one of my mentors uh and idols is danny meyer and that's his whole uh, philosophy it's like you can teach anybody how to take an order you can teach mm. anybody how to fry something in a pan you can teach anybody uh to serve mm -hmm. uh be a server uh be a bartender you can teach all that that's just 
skill yeah. that you can teach, but what you can't teach is hospitality. You can't teach someone to have that gene that says, I, no matter what, I want to help this person, uh, good, bad, or ugly. And, you know, for me, while we're on the subject, like it, it's, it's very hard for me uh, to ever imagine that I'll ever have more than three restaurants. And at any, like, okay. let's just say I become the most famous restaurant tour in the next five years. Um, it'll be because I won't ever have one three restaurants because along with growth, you know, with success comes growth. You open, like you, you look at all the great restaurant groups, you look at lettuce entertain you Boca, uh, um, dynamic, uh, one off, which is my favorite restaurant group, Paul Cahan and Donnie Medea look up to them. Uh, Donnie's an old friend of mine. Um, they grew because they became successful, right? Mm. But with that growth and with that success, you don't you don't necessarily dilute your mission statement, your brand, or your concept. But what you do dilute is what got you there, which is that core group of people mm. uh, you can't retain, you can't keep, because as you grow, you need more staff. As you grow, you need more managers. As you grow, you need a larger personnel outlay. So for me, my success has always been, well, uh, and the biggest struggle for me, and I, I'm sure a lot of people, is how do we develop people within, like I open restaurant one. Right. My only concern isn't uh, with restaurant number two is uh, how do I uh, make even more money and how do I grow and expand uh, this great concept or this great brand or this great group. It would be, okay, well, how do I make sure that now Ali is a beverage director uh, at the next restaurant? And then restaurant three, how do we make her uh the beverage director the corporate beverage director right. for the company so th that's what everybody struggles with, not least of all me i'm a little guy on the, sure. on the, at the, at the bottom of the totem pole but i would i it's really really becomes harder every year because it, it, you know restaurants are so competitive and like amazing groups find it harder and harder to find amazing people they have their core people uh, that, that started with them when they were frankensteining their first restaurant together mm -hmm. and then as they grow like i'm sure when boca opened boca uh, 12 years ago, and then now, you know, uh, 19 restaurants later, mm. uh, do they have the same core people? Sure they do. They have probably, you know, half of them still in administrative positions, right. guy driving the train. But to have this, to replicate and duplicate and clone uh, that on a consistent basis is, it's impossible. It's, it's like, okay, I, I, I had a chariot with one unicorn, uh, now I have five chariots and I need six unicorns in front of each one of them. It's, mm. it's impossible. Okay. Now on a more day to day basis, you know, all good employees have their off days. They're not, they're not feeling it. Um, what do you, is there anything you do on a practical level to, to help them get back on their feet? Do you send them home or do you, what do you do? Sure. Well, like I said, I'm usually very connected and I've always thrives because again uh for me the product of every restaurant that i've ever been at is is my staff is mm -hmm. the people that help me get where i want to uh get to so you know sh and she's seen it there's more drama like someone needs to do a real a real reality show <laughs> yes not a show where it's scripted <laughs> and people like when you know you're on camera you act differently right mm -hmm. so it's not reality mm -hmm. someone needs to open a restaurant maybe it's me everyone signs one at the beginning uh, that says anytime you're here, you're going to be on camera. Right, right. And then you wait two, three months and you install hidden cameras or they're already there. <laughs> then you could really see, because here, the the drama, number one, and Murphy's Law yeah. strikes at a restaurant more than at any business oh my God. in the world. And what I mean by that is, we'll skip the drama for now, okay. but Murphy's Law, it could be a Friday night. And every Friday night since we've been open, we could do 700 covers, and we're all staffed up. She's dressed in lines, got the red lipstick on, and I've got <laughs> extra bus boys and extra. I'm loaded to the gills with staff. We got tons of product. Uh, we got full hostesses. We're fully staffed, raring to go. We got everything. We've got yeah. backup everything. And it's 75 degree weather out, and it's perfect night out, and there's no conventions in town. There's no street mark, street fairs, nothing, and. 50% of the book will cancel. Yet, on a Monday, when Food Runner broke his leg and two people got sick people and bartender over. didn't know he has to work and you you literally have half the staff that you're supposed to have and you normally do 20 people, 
uh, a busload of the fraternal uh, order of elk show up and say, hey, there's 50 of us. We need a table. It's just the always. Murphy's Law okay. always strikes. Okay. If you think it's going to be good, it'll be bad. If you think it's going to be bad, it'll be good. If you think you're ready, you're not. If you think if you, you have time to eat, you don't. You don't. It's, People come wow. in. It's if you... just the most weird. It is. <laughs> in 35 years, I'm always like it never – like a, you can – you can rely on the unreliability right, of right. the restaurant business. Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, you don't, yeah. And then drama, because you're dealing with, like if you have a really good restaurant, uh, what makes a good restaurant is the people. Your people are very emotional. They're mm. very passionate. Mm. Usually, this is the only thing they do. They're not, oh, I'm a mortgage broker during the day and I do this at night for supplemental income. She's a professional. She's an industry professional. Most of the people that uh, work with me or that I try to acquire uh, as, a, as a collective, are th- th- this is the only place they work. Mm. Like the, the restaurant or working with me is the only place that they work. Right. Um, so that makes you a family. And like every family, you're hugely dysfunctional. So am I the dad and the mom? What I try to do, and I was lucky enough to have, you know, my right hand uh, in my most recent place, Katana, was Dila Lee, who is now uh, the amazing uh, beverage director at Tao. Her and I were simpatico, synergy. She was the mom. I was the dad. Uh, her and I could look at each other, and I knew exactly what she was going to say without her having, like, nice. we communicated on, right. on another level. Plus, you know, we just had a lot of respect and admiration for each other, and we had both uh, been in Japanese cuisine for a long time. She, There's no one that knows sake and the beverage program better than Dila uh, and operations and admin. There's no one that knows operations at least – uh, to the level I can, <laughs> I've, sure. I've acquired, uh, but you know, it's really being a, a, a very soulful human being. If you have, if, if you, if you're a person, I'd like to think I'm a good person and to answer your question directly and as best I can. Yeah. When something goes wrong, uh, in the restaurant, whether it's a guest, but more importantly, if it's with the staff, yeah, I, I care more about them than I do about myself. And I care more about what happens to them. Uh, than myself and so do all my friends all my friends are chefs and restaurateurs my closest best friends uh are all in the business and they feel the same way they're in a documentary and they said the same thing if i have ten dollars and you need it it's yours you you need a shirt i'll take it off my back because i know that my staff and the, the family that i create is willing to do anything for me while they're at work uh and that's all i can ask so because they do that to me i owe it to them uh, for everything else. Yeah, you work for them. Absolutely. Essentially, essentially yeah. I do. Like, the very first day uh, we had our s- staff meeting and training, it was really about, like, how do I make this place that we're going to all live in for the next few years, five years, ten years, whatever it is, how do I make this place the most productive for you so that you're happy? Because if they're happy, then they're going to make the guests happy. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, so... Do you guys do like a, a huddle before shift and things like that? Everybody does a pre-shift. You, sometimes they only do it on busy nights or on Friday, Saturday. We did it every night, and uh-huh. I make it a very integral part of the day. It's, it's literally sets the tone, the pace, and the more important, the attitude. Yeah. Uh, for the night. Yeah, you have a way with words, right? So I, I can only imagine what they're what they're like. It was always very you know? uh, very motivational. It wasn't even just about a lot of times your pre shift at work is saying what the specials are, just kind of going over like yeah. the, the the mechanics of it. But his was always kind of like this uplifting speech that got everyone. You could come in there being like, oh god, like I just had you know broke up my boyfriend or whatever. But you go into work and he has this speech like, okay, yep, yeah, let's do this. And everyone's on the same page, and it kind of brings this like cohesive team energy to it and ready to start. Um, rather than just kind of knowing about the little specials and everything like that. Like, that doesn't matter at the end. It is about um, how everyone's feeling because that definitely people can feel that and guests can feel that. And so he had definitely a great way of kind of starting that off. And it was always the the Jason motivational uh, speech for our our pre-shifts. And you can't really do that if you had more than three places. No, you can't. Yeah, you're unless only... one's a breakfast place, one's yeah. a lunch place. Unless you can. (laughs) Yeah. And unless you can clone or... Find someone uh, that's a subordinate that can uh, literally replicate right. uh, your message and your voice and what you're trying to, which is certainly possible, absolutely. Because, yeah. like I said, I'm, you know, as much as my mom would think I'm special, I don't think I'm that special. But I, in the restaurant world, there is a, I, I think there is a formula to success, and it's really connecting with people on a deeper level. And you do it through food and the experience. And 
how do you keep that though? Like one of the things I've always wondered about you is, so you've been in this for so long and it does get like hard every day. You, it c kind of can be the same thing. It's, it's, you're going in and you have to kind of leave everything at the door and become um, a, like a better version of yourself just for those eight, 10 hours, however you're doing it. And like for you to do it for so long and not necessarily burn out or burnout is huge in the industry. You do this yeah. for a couple of years and all these interactions like take a toll on you because sure. you're giving so much of yourself mm -hmm. that you don't take care of your own self a right. lot. Like you leave just feeling drained on some, on some occasions. Um, and so for him to be doing this for this long and still be able to go in every day and have such like a positive attitude and remember people and kind of keep that outlook. Like how do you keep that kind of passion behind it and say like today I'm, I'm still going to be this person rather than kind of like, Oh God, I'm so tired now from doing this. Well, thanks for asking that question because um, that's really close to my heart. And it's really, you're, you're basically asking me to identify uh, who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, there's two things that I'm really super passionate about aside from my closest five best friends and my family uh it's what i do because you always equate what you do f to who you are it's what defines you so for me it's you know the hospitality business and martial arts so martial arts is a huge key because nobody realizes how primal or primitive but also essential it is to first thing in the morning punch or kick something mm. because you kind of release any frustrations you were carrying 12 to 24 hours prior. You also, whenever you work out and you do the type of workout that I do in martial arts, you release serotonin, dopamine, uh, adrenaline, and uh, endorphins, right? So you're already having these mood enhancers, natural mm -hmm. uh, mood enhancers, right? I drink tequila at night, and that's a huge, that's that's no secret. Let me guess, Fortaleza. Uh, there you go. <laughs> she knows me. Uh, so I'm doing these things that uh, you look as a, I'm a son, uh, I'm a, uh, employer, I'm a partner, I'm uh, things to so many different, I'm a sensei, I'm uh, a student, I'm so many things. And especially in the restaurant business, you're constantly this wheel, like one of those, uh, those windmills or a water wheel. You're constantly emitting what? What we do for a living we have to make everybody happy all the time so we're giving part of ourselves to our guests to our co-workers to our family to our friends to everybody so you have to do one thing uh, maybe one hour a day that's giving back to yourself uh positively number two you're hitting and punching something which is great therapy because you don't hold it in you let it out uh and then uh thirdly you're releasing all these natural mood enhancers in your body which really kind of keep me happy and happy's you know, it's uh, not a destination. It's the journey there. I'm happy every day. I decide to be happy. Yeah. Secondly, uh, besides martial arts, hospitality, the hospitality business, like how do I keep myself so inspirational? Well, the best way to be inspiring is to be inspired. So every day I scour the internet and I read books and I look to mentors and I look uh, to famous people who are uh, achieved great, amazing things, whether it's athletically or politically or celebrity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a, it's basically, it's a give and take and it's something that's reciprocal. Like when I am inspired by something, I take from that and say, okay, well, I'm gonna use this to inspire my staff or my yeah. students or myself. Yeah. Um, you know, I like to consider myself uh, like Hawaii. I'm 82 degrees and sunny oh, every day. Oh, hey. But, you know, even in Hawaii, there's that one or two weeks where it gets cloudy and rainy, Storms, right? Yeah. I'm human. I, I can, when, you, when you're, it, it's, don't ask me how I know this, but it's like being on ecstasy. <laughs> like you're high and then you, you'll have a low once you're that high, right? Yeah, it's, hard, yeah. it's hard to stay that high. Mm -hmm. So when I do uh, at times hit a low, I self-audit myself and say, well, why am I feeling this way? And what can I do to kind of, re-inspire myself and because a lot of things in this world right now like i don't watch the world news. i used to watch get, make a cup of coffee and watch the world news it's like armageddon like yeah. seven plane crashes uh eight shark attacks uh trump uh, all this stuff that's really depressing and can pull you down and weigh on your soul as a human being like we become so uh desensitized to things and like you said what's what's burnout burnout is really being unsensitive to daily negativity 
right? And that's yeah. what burns you out. It's not the positive. You never get burnt mm-hmm. out from doing what you love, yeah. right? right? Otherwise, uh, triathletes would uh, give up after the first triathlon, right? right? So you get burnt out on the negativity. And so for me, I try not to, I, I'll, I can see it and accept it, but I won't absorb it. Okay. And then when it comes to work, if I really put it into perspective for a lot of the, uh, the people that work with me that, hey, you know, you're like a ship. And in this whole day of 24 hours, you don't have to be here for six hours or seven hours. So, you know, don't let anything permeate your an iron ship. If there's one little tiny hole, the ocean gets into that ship mm-hmm. and it sinks. So, you know, uh, it just doesn't apply to restaurants, your business, anybody's business. While you're at work, our work is to make people happy mm. to to so that they can receive pleasure for the time that they're there, which means you have to smile, you have to project happiness, you have to project the uh, the total experience. Right, right. Um, in the Is it common to have insurance in the restaurant in- industry? It wasn't until recently, Yeah, but you know, it, it becomes harder and harder on both sides. Yeah. Um, you know, in California, when I was uh, spent some time on the West Coast for six months, a lot of restaurants actually put it on the bill, would you like to uh, donate uh, 2% oh. of the bill? to help our health fund for our employees. Some people get appalled well, in the Midwest, they get appalled by that. Mm-hmm. Not so much in the West Coast because it's a thing now and it's become normalized. Uh, but yeah, so I'll give you an example. Um, Brandon Sadikoff from Hogsall, um, after my uh, health battle, uh, helped me out with insurance out of his own pocket mm-hmm. because I didn't have health right. insurance. And at the time, just pre-Obamacare, uh, I had a pre-existing condition which made uh, health insurance is virtually impossible, healthcare is virtually impossible or very, very expensive. And if not been for his help monetarily, I wouldn't have been able to have insurance, mm-hmm. right? Despite how much money I made, it's it was a fixed cost that was surmountable. So uh, as we've moved on, you know, the whole debate politically and it's part of, uh, it's a big topic in in politics and our culture right now is, you know, our healthcare plan and our healthcare system. Nobody realizes, and like I said, I, it's coming from an integral place for me. Like, I've always tried uh, to make sure that whoever I'm working with is a partner or whether it was my own small place. And I've only had small 50 uh, uh, seat places and where I've had maybe 12 to 20 employees and I wasn't required to, but I always made sure that I pitched in or paid for half, especially for the females. It's not that I was biased. It's just that, you know, uh, the the success of a lot of my restaurants, most of my staff was female, and I had to make sure they took care mm-hmm. of of my staff. So insurance is a huge thing. It's 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 one of those mood points where uh, I don't think there's going to be an easy resolution for us in the restaurant business because, like I said earlier, it's the overhead to operate a restaurant on any scale. is The, the overhead keeps going up. Right, mm. and the profits keep going mm-hmm. down. The competition keeps mm-hmm. going up, and it becomes harder and harder unless you're a large restaurant corporation. Interesting for sustainability to operate. Okay, so in addition to insurance, what about opportunities to practice health um, together? Maybe like in in restaurant y- yoga sessions or whatever, sure, you know things like that, or like bring them it's to very, your dojo or yeah, it's very Actually, progressive. He did that. I've always done oh, that. there you go. Okay, yeah, I went to one of he, he did a, a very nice since he does work with a lot of females, like he said he okay. he offered a, um, a self defense class for women. Right. For so one afternoon we just went out for a couple hours and he taught us just basic skills, which I think any women should take i think it's an amazing knowledge to have but um like he offered that just for anyone that was wanting to to learn something like that and i yeah and i think that's a a great thing to do for sure it goes far beyond being responsible or caring uh manager or employer Mm -hmm. it's you know they all show up for work and did everything i asked them to do and it was in river north at a time where people were getting mugged and raped and sexually assaulted Mm -hmm. and and battered and attacked. So, uh, you know, there's a couple a couple instances happened in River North, uh, two blocks away from the restaurant. And so I said, you know, I should do a sexual assault class. Uh, after she left, I uh, did a active shooter uh, class with CPR and all that stuff. Because who knows? Like, n- you know, now everybody's a target. Mm-hmm. Um, before it was like the elderly and women. Now it's, it can happen anywhere. Any neighborhood, uh, anywhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, it's beyond... Uh, person-to-person assault it's now you know 
mass shootings and it's usually in places where people uh congregate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh having, unfortunately having you around was like our, our bodyguard though you, you knew if something uh, yeah, went down that jason was, was gonna gonna show up there was an incident where someone stole a cell phone you chased him yeah, yeah that was at my, one of my restaurants yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. good for you yeah <laughs> but i think you know again that's like in, that's when i was talking about like emotional intelligence you have to look beyond what's on paper and you know uh, your whole restaurant you have to look at the people you have to have a sense and like i have this crazy spider sense uh sixth sense of like who's a turd <laughs> who's gonna i'm gonna have to ask to leave who's gonna be a problem who's who's gonna definitely have too much to drink and okay Who's got the Bob haircut? It's I need to speak to the, the, Karen. oh, the Karens. The Karens. The Karens. Yeah. The Karens. So, so, so okay, good segue. What are your thoughts on like Yelp reviewers and people that are just? I just, don't. Oh. No thoughts. I learned it. At, so I opened my first restaurant, my first solo independent restaurant in 2005, and I reached out to a, a food critic mm -hmm. who wrote for uh, one of. There was sometimes in Tribune. I don't want to say who sure. it was, but I asked him for advice. I said. This is right when Yelp came out. He said, uh, Jason, he goes, you don't read it. You're never as good as your last review, and you're never as bad as your last review. So meaning that, you know, one's person opinion, like even coming straight from a food critic, like that's his interpretation and that's his opinion. It's a professional, uh, calculated, uh, well-thought-out opinion that holds value to the peers in the industry I'm in. Yelp does not. Yelp is... Uh, hmm. uh, well, this is all I have to say about Yelpers. You, you can't polish a turd. <laughs> if someone so if comes you're a turd, and everyone and says they're a professional. Yeah. yeah. If Yelp you're a reviewer, Yelp elite, an elite, oh. elitist, <laughs> you can't polish a turd. They, they come in thinking it's a, a good thing to have when they sit down and say that they are a top reviewer. It? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh, oh yes. And you have to understand that. Yeah. You know, I've been in the corporate restaurant world for the last five years. Before that, I was an independent, but I was with two major uh, restaurant corporations and groups, and they held a lot of value. They had people actually scouring R respond, through, right? a, through a robot and through an app that would collectively collect all the uh, all the reviews on uh, Google, uh, Facebook, and Yelp, and TripAdvisor. It would all collate every week, and then they would go through them all and respond. Wow. And then they would send you a report and say, well, this is what... Now, here's what I... I've never looked at Yelp. But what I would do is have, like, an office manager or someone say, okay, listen, if the, if we get five Yelp reviews that say there's a stain in the lowered ceiling tile, mm. uh, that's something we probably got to fix. If they say, oh, I came here seven times in a row and I asked for uh, 1942 and they didn't have it, then th that I get. Sure. But yeah, overall, just to be nice I don't even... I've never in... in 25 years of my own restaurants, I've never looked at one Yelp review for my restaurant or for my page, ever. Okay. Just totally okay. disregarded. For me, I'm old school, so the review that comes out from Phil Vitell or uh, online with like a uh, uh, Chicago magazine or mm -hmm. Chicago social, things of that nature, like editorial stuff, absolutely, because I'm old school, because that sticks around. It's sitting in people's waiting rooms and offices and and people read it and it's right. there for it's kind of there right, in right. perpetuity uh online stuff i could i could i could literally go online right now and say uh, victor uh smells like rotten eggs and tomorrow <laughs> because of all the content that gets loaded you'd have to scroll down for like four, three four minutes to find uh, that post again right, so it's right. you know, just it's waste your time at is. that time okay yeah at that people point. are keyboard keyboard uh, warriors as well they won't say anything to you until they go home and then go behind the screen and, yes yeah and, and that's you, a whole nother freedom is, that they and this they is a segue to. into something that i feel i've been doing the opposite i think we're now in the restaurant culture we've been pushed into this concept that this once they're in the you come in the restaurant, you sit down, you almost know that you can play me. You can complain to her and say, there was a toenail in my drink. She'll say, no, I'm so sorry. There was a toenail in your drink? Because he, you know that she knows, and if she tells me that I know, and we'll both know that you're going to go on this and say, there was a toenail in my drink, even if there wasn't. 
So right away we're going to offer to buy. Yeah. <laughs> right away we're going to offer to buy your drink, give you a uh, gift card, ask you to come back and buy okay. an appetizer. Mm -hmm. And so people it, exploit that. To lack of, uh, oh. there's a small percentage of people that know this. Well, let's just face it. There's a big percentage of people they do it on a, not that extreme level. But it's my birthday. It's not your birthday. Let me see ready. <laughs> it's not your birthday because they're going to get a free dessert. And so they try to tie in them outing you or putting you on blast, so to speak, on social media or on a review. Mm -hmm. And for me, here's the funniest thing. Yeah. What I've done is I've turned it around. I say, I'm sorry, but maybe this isn't the place for you. No way. Which is it, which amazing. Works. And not... they don't, they yeah. don't put anything up because here's the thing. The people that, I could, you could come into uh, one of my restaurants and say, uh, I had the salmon here. I'm sorry, we've never had salmon on the menu. No, I had it here last week. I'm outraged. You don't have it. I want a free dessert or I want you to count my bill. I would, here's the thing about people that aren't used to being, what it is, is they're outraged that you're saying no to them. They don't care about the subject. Mm -hmm. They don't care about, it's just that you're telling them no. And mm. so what you're upset out, upset at is that I'm not telling you what you want to hear. Mm. So the greatest thing that I find psychologically that's happened about the restaurant guests is that the same person that feels so entitled and they can never be told no, when you tell them that they probably this place isn't probably for them, then they get all quiet. They say, okay, I'll be good. Yeah, I'll take whatever. I know there, there's no salmon. Do you have bass? Because mm -hmm. when you turn around and not put your foot down and say, I'm not going to let you treat her this way because it's right. a false narrative. You're not. Uh, you're blaming her for they're not being salmon because there's never salmon on the menu, right? Right. Uh, and I'm telling you now, uh, not only that I'm not telling you what you want to hear, but I'm telling you, well, maybe this isn't the place for you. Well, once they feel like you're putting them outside of the place that everybody is supposed to be, then they turn around. They don't, I've never, anybody I've done that to has never put a negative uh, response or called me or sent me an email and said, I was outraged by the way you talked to me or whatnot. Because to a certain level, it's like the person that's always uh, a yes man. Mm -hmm. They're used to it. Mm -hmm. And then the first person that is... That tells them no. Yeah. That tells them no, they're like, oh, wow, he just put me in my place. I, God damn, I can't stand but they, him. But they but love it. I love him. <laughs> this exactly. is one of my... I probably shouldn't even be saying this, but this is one of my secrets bartending as well, though. Like, people, other coworkers are amazed by what I get away with talking about to, to guests, what I say to them, how I interact with them, because it can seem very uh, forward, honest, all of that. And, like, if, it's if he's... integrity. And if, if he's saying, yeah. like, it's not... To me, it's not the customer is always right. I don't have that mentality. Like, it's it's about if you're trying to take advantage of me, like, I, I, I know that. I can I can feel that. And so it's it's the way you go about kind of telling him that and kind of putting these little things like in like he he just said saying like oh maybe this isn't the place for you that's such a good way to put it too right yeah because i have at the at the bar you can ha you're a little more free than you are maybe like as a server or something but people always respond positively after that to me and this is why i have a great group of regulars that come back because it's it's i'm always honest with them i'm just i'm real with them and i'm not doing the whole hi like welcome my name is leah i'll take care of you like it's just very it's very down to earth, and I think yeah. that people appreciate, it. and that's why, even when I was working at Katana with him, like we had a lot of very high clientele. Like we had Taylor Kinney come in. We had right, we had right. a bunch, and even even one of my favorite stories of Taylor Kinney was when even... I didn't know it was him, and he was sitting at my bar, and I made a joke because uh, he was drinking a, a red drink, and I said, "Who comes cranberry to a bar vodka. and drinks cranberry, cranberry juice?" Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and he like looks up and I was like, oh, it's a good looking man. We start chatting and everything. And uh, he ends up meeting the rest of his uh, party and they go to a table. But afterwards, someone came up to me and was like, you know who we were just talking to, right? I'm like, no, I had no idea. <laughs> Taylor Kinney. So I Googled it. I was like, oh, God, I'm an idiot. Um, anyways, he kept coming back. And anytime he would come back, he'd come and sit at the bar with me for a little bit. And we'd yeah. chat. And he even came in on my last day there. Um, and it was just, I think, that type of... Candidness. Yeah, with them. Really, really... Well, she's right because... Uh, the customer isn't always right, but a good person is always right. Okay. So I you like have to that. read every guest. You have to read every customer. And you, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, you know the person that walks up to you like this with their video on is like, I want a free dessert because get out uh, of here. Yeah, I've had there? that exactly. Yeah, I've had people video me before. Yeah. What? Yeah. Exactly. Complain to managers. Threatened to send it to corporate for for things as silly as I wasn't making 
their mimosa fast enough because there was 20 people in front of them ordering like that kind of stuff like okay. it's people try to get away with a lot of stuff that's interesting mm-hmm. yeah this is a blessing and a curse it yep. drives business into a restaurant it right. shows uh people that have never been to the restaurant the lifestyle uh personally of what we're doing in our own lifestyle or right. what's, what's happening at the restaurant but at the same time there's a lot of people that take advantage and try to exploit that when they're in the restaurant so it's a thing and i, I think uh, as time goes on, uh, from we're getting past millennials to now Gen Z, and past Gen Z, I don't even know what the hell's going to happen or pop yeah. up after that. But uh, for me, it's taking a lot of the soul out of what we do, which is hospitality, because now, uh, to what end? You're just going to say yes and buy everything for everybody that comes in? No, you, you, at some point, you have to mm. do it graciously. You have to read every guest. You have to uh, walk lightly. And like, I. For me, it's worked every single time. The, a couple times when it didn't work, and then you know, I said, "Well, maybe this place isn't for you." It's like, well, I, you know, this is egregious, and you're a jerk, and uh, you're this, and you're that. And then I'll look him right in the eye and I say, "Thank you for telling me that. You're, you're you're probably right." And then they're like, "Now what?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> right? Because yeah. you, you you know, it's like. Uh, it's like Eminem in Eight Mile when he's like, I am white. I do live in a trailer park. My mom did have sex with my friend from high school. When you take away the all power, your, you're taking the, away all the you, power. You take it away and say, yeah. yeah, you're right. I'm egregious and I'm nasty and I'm, you're right. Like all these people are here, uh, are dining here tonight because I'm the <laughs> asshole. You're right. Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And you take care of your team, you know, you're looking, you trust your team. Well, bottom line is no matter what, and anybody that's ever worked with me knows is that I value the guests because they're our, our bread and butter. They're the ones that, uh, they're the ones that keep us in business. But to what end? The minute you start uh, verbally assaulting or uh, treating one of the people that I work with in an in a, in a adverse or negative way, I don't care who you are. You can be... It doesn't matter who you are. Mm -hmm. You're not welcome. Yeah. Uh, whether it's me and a partner and me independently, you can't, you, I can't stand, uh, we're in hospitality and that is expressed most importantly through the people that I work with every day. Yeah. Um, with shows like Chef's Table and Parts Unknown, and anything Anthony Bourdain or anything like that, highlighting um, amazing hospitality and culinary experiences around the world, people are, are now more aware of what's out there. Um, I think there was an episode on Alinea on Chef's Table. Absolutely. And But for the for the public, or most of the public, Alinea might be a little ex inaccessible sure. as far as cost goes. Um, so when you're coming up with a new concept, is accessibility part of that? You want Do you want the mass public to try and experience Jason Chan? Well, so here's um, my kind of philosophy on that. Um, I've come up with three of my own concepts. You know, they're not uh, the only concept in the world, mm -hmm. obviously. But I have a mentor in life who was a restaurateur uh, many, many years ago. And he's been my mentor since uh, 1985. And I travel out to L.A. to see him. I call him once a week. He's uh, His son was my best friend. Sushi? Um, the guy that came he, up with the sushi? He brought sushi like... to America. Okay. Yeah, okay. opened the first one in, in California. And he's done many amazing things. And I look up to him. He's a best friend and a, and a mentor and a guiding uh, light in my life. Mm -hmm. And one thing he taught me long ago, which I applied to everything, but then particularly to restaurants, is that before you do something, you have to approach it and look at what the audience is first. Because you can't do something without knowing what audience you want to appeal to mm -hmm. first. So I'll give you an example. Uh, right now, um, you, you talked about um, the awareness. Okay, Chicago in 2017 had 40 million uh, tourists uh, travel to Chicago. R roughly uh, 22 million for business and about 18 million uh, for recreation, just tourists. Uh, from 2017 to last year, 2018, it went from 40 million to 58 million. So wow. 18 million more people came to Chicago in one year. And it was because of the awareness of food and our restaurant culture. We're now the restaurant capital, as I like to call it, of North America because James Baird. The last three, four years, James There's, Baird has yeah. had their awards here so you have 30,000 restaurateurs chefs cooks managers traveling here every year 
they eat and dine everywhere for the five days that they're here. Then they go back to their prospective cities and they talk about the amazing experience that they had at Girl and the Goat, at Flight Club, at Katana, at Alinea, at everywhere. And they go back and this inspires and uh, basically ignites something in everybody in that industry in their town. And then they want to travel, work, or visit Chicago mm. to experience the food scene here. Um, and then that also trickers, trickles over to the second tier, which is anybody that's doing business here now realizes, wow, I saw an Anthony Bourdain, the place that he went to for hot dogs and tamales and ribs and this. And so uh, one begets the other. And as far as awareness goes, the number one uh, out of all 58 million, the number one restaurant that all 58 million wanted to go to was a steak restaurant. Mm. Number two was pizza. <laughs> And number three was Italian, right? So when you come up with a concept, I should open a steak, pizza, and Italian restaurant. Because <laughs> I'm almost assuredly going to be busy now. Of course, that's not an absolute. There's nothing guaranteed. But uh, with that being said, uh, I operate from a – I do a list, not of things – a lot of people say, okay, I'm going to open a, a business – and I want to do five things that nobody else is doing. Mm -hmm. or I want to have five items that nobody else has. Or I want to carry five dishes, five drinks, five concepts in a restaurant that no one else is doing. I usually try to come up with a very copious, long list of things what not to do. Because I don't want to be like everybody else. So I don't want to do tacos. I don't want to do ramen. I don't want to do X, Y, and Z. And then from that process of elimination, I kind of get a, my head around a concept and an audience that I want to cater to. No way. Um, with James Baird and Michelin, how do you? Is that something to aspire to? Do you have this in the back of your mind when coming up with? So I'm going to to a lot of people. My first restaurant that I opened in 2005, like me and my chef cooked at the James Baird House in 2005. We we're invited as a guest host. Uh, uh, restaurant okay. to cook dinner there. Uh, I was nominated. Uh, we were nominated for James Baird uh, in 2005 at my first restaurant, Butter. Um, Michelin, I got a Michelin recognition in the form of a Bib Gourmand uh, for Juno. Um, my uh, one of the three concepts I want to do in the future uh, involve a small 25 seat uh, Japanese concept, which mm. I that would be the goal. I think everybody that's looking to do upper tier progressive contemporary fine dining obviously that's kind of the goal but more importantly you should really and like we all do and i've always preached you focus on making people happy your guests right. happy first and that'll that'll all follow if you do it right if people love it you're gonna attract all that yeah yeah you mentioned uh it's nice to be validated by your right. peers and by you know getting accolades and awards absolutely um it feels amazing it's probably you know it's like winning the academy award at a restaurant Right, right. And it doesn't have to be this grand building no. with ambiance. Like you mentioned, like how Big Star lacks yeah. that, and it's, it's it falls down to... I went to dim sum places in Hong Kong <laughs> that had a Michelin star that right. were, yeah, you wouldn't, I, you wouldn't go in the bathroom without gloves on. Like, it's, yeah. <laughs> Singapore has stalls that are Michelin rated. Mm. Um, you know, it's relative. Yeah. I think if you have a really unique concept, that just really focuses on service and hospitality and the ingredients of the food. Uh, that's the most important thing. I went to a place called Rich Table in San Francisco recently, and the one thing that stuck out was every time you would get to go to the bathroom, any one of their waiters or waitresses would come and refold your napkin in an elaborate design. Mm -hmm. Or not just your waiter or waitress, but all of them would come up and refill your water or ask how, how's everything going. Um, is there any practical advice or skill that you would implement in your businesses in addition to, you know, the touch on the shoulder, hey, how's it going, or the, you know, remembering people's names? Is there, is there anything more that, that restaurants should be doing sure. to retain these clients that keep coming back? It's um, <clears throat> every time I uh, have had a restaurant of my own or managed a restaurant or partnered with someone with a restaurant, the the whole service hospitality seminar starts off with one premise and it's now it speaks uh, volumes and serves a lot of people well right now because it's the culture we live in mm -hmm. but the one thing I do in 
uh, it was in the first meeting I had with the service staff at Katana when I worked with Aliyah, is uh, imagine that every single person that comes into the restaurant has a chalkboard tied around their neck. And on the chalkboard it says, make me feel special. <laughs> That's, you know, the, the cliche is that you can't make everybody happy all the time. In the restaurant business, whether you're a bartender, a manager, an owner, server, you're literally in the business of making everybody happy all the time. Usually, uh, the guests are last. You have to make yourself happy first. You have to make your boss happy. You have to make the chef happy. You mm -hmm. have to make the bar director happy. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that your bar back's happy so he doesn't screw you over while you're working. Like it, You have to make so many people happy. And then you have to smile, even though your dog died and you broke up with your significant other yeah. and you can't pay your rent or you've got eczema <laughs> right on the side of your neck. Like, hi, how are you? You gotta be happy. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's, it, you think about it, uh, they say insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a diff different result. We do that on a minute to minute basis in the restaurant business. Because huh. we're always trying to affect, <sighs> you know, we're doing the same thing every day. It's yeah. a, it's a day filled with rituals. You do your setup, you set up your bar, you do your mise en place, you zone everything out, you stock everything, and then you do your spiel. Hi, how are you? Welcome to so-and-so, mm -hmm. and I'm going to love you to pieces if you take care of me, and I'll take care of you. And it's just this, you do it every single, and it's exhausting. Yeah. Imagine being in a relationship, living with someone. Let's say, like, uh, Salma Hayek's My Celebrity Crush. Hmm. Imagine every day, for eight hours a day, if I had to just wait on her every day for eight hours a day after 10 well with some hike maybe after 20 days i'd be like god i can't stand you get out get away from me i'm tired of you know basically if she were to die tomorrow uh or we're on her deathbed uh well i'm sorry the other way around if if i were on my deathbed her life would have to flash before my life and that's the life of the restaurant like if you're dying your your life isn't passing before your eyes. Your guest is, mm -hmm. or your manager, or your you know whoever right. your supervisor. Right. Like it's right. it's eight people. Right, right. But what about like the negative part of that? Like a big thing that a lot of people don't talk about in the industry, um, which actually is big in the EMS industry and police uh, as well, is like the the negative part of things. Like it, it does have such a big toll on you mentally and physically that a lot of times people resort to to drugs, to alcohol, to kind of this really unhealthy lifestyle outside of work to be able to cope with how much they're giving out at work. And mm -hmm. it's become a really big thing and people don't talk about it because especially in, in the restaurant industry, it's all fun and games. Everyone's happy and everyone's joking. And then you go home and you don't even have energy to wash your dishes or take out, you know, take your dog for a walk or anything. And then you're just in this, it's, and then people then back to work the next day and it's back on again and, and doing it. So it's kind of like a, it's, I mean, more and more now that in 2019 it's becoming more of a, a, a thing that people talk about is kind of like the mental health part of mm. things. But it's hard to kind of watch people go through this and not <clears throat> know that there is a support system out there. And, and the I know like police have a really high suicide rate and kind of how, how do you kind of manage the, the negative side of that and make sure everyone is, is happy enough in that way, I guess? too to like not have to resort to those things sure well i you know i can speak from experience uh having you know been a chef 30 years ago and uh, all the trials and tribulations of being an independent owner and then a partner and just being in the business in general and like right now it's really prevalent that there's a lot of depression and drug abuse and alcohol abuse and uh emotional uh, dysfunctions with people in the restaurant business um, because it's become it's come to the surface like many things uh, you know uh, socially socially and politically but uh, here's the thing okay you work if you work 12 hours whether you're a doctor a bartender or a restaurant or manager mm -hmm. if you work somewhere for 12 hours you spent the majority of the day that normal people uh, living their lives, uh, you're, you're leaving uh, in the morning and mid-afternoon, you're getting home well after midnight. If you have a significant other or if you don't, doesn't matter, you're getting off work at a time when the only options you have are food and drink. Aside from that, if you, because for that 12 hours, you're expelling and omitting, emitting so much energy for other people that you have this concentrated amount of time. Okay, well, it's 
12 o'clock. It's 1 o'clock. I only have an hour to drink something, smoke something, eat something, rub something, <laughs> hold something. <laughs> uh, so because then I got to go home and I got to do this all over again. So my restaurant, everything's organized. Bills are paid. Office is clean. Everybody's in order. You go to my house, it looks like a bomb blow up. Mm. Uh, you ask me to do 10 things for you by tomorrow, they'll be done that night. Uh, my girlfriend asked me one thing to do three months from now. There's a dinner we have to go to in, uh, on November 15th. I'll forget. <laughs> right? Because mm -hmm. you're selfless. And when you operate on selfless, um, you have nowhere to escape. When you live that life cycle, you have no escape. Mm -hmm. Why do you do drugs? Why do you... Uh, drink and abuse alcohol because you're using it to escape because you only have a short amount of time to escape reality. Because then if you are married, you know, you just solved uh, a problem between the chef and the general manager or the bartender and her bar back or the hostesses and the staff. You're dealing, you're putting out fires all day at work and when you go home, really the last thing you want to do is solve problems, mm -hmm. mainly with your significant other. You don't want to talk about problems. You don't mm -hmm. want to deal with problems. What you want to do is uh, eat a bowl of cheesy poos in your underwear and yes. have them sit next to you and watch uh, guilty <laughs> pleasures like ice road truckers or something that you can just exactly zone out <laughs> and do nothing. And if there's a bong around, then the yeah. even better, right? Yeah, or a bowl yeah, of ice cream. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not a lifestyle you'd wish on someone you really love it's hard it's hard. isn't that remarkable like mm -hmm. if you had a daughter or a sister or a best friend that said yeah i'm gonna be a chef kind of what your parents are going through yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. Full circle. you yeah. wouldn't wish it on a person that you actually love you'd yes. be like no nah, be a doctor you give up a lot you don't you if work you're gonna most work that holidays hard, you yeah. work the weekends you work every happy hour like you're not able to for me to have nine to five friends, it's so hard to hang out with them. Like, yeah, how does a uh, Thursday morning at 1 a.m. sound? And they're like, well, what? What? That's I wake up in four hours to go to yeah. work. Yeah. It's it's hard to maintain normal relationships with people that aren't it's... in your industry. So then you keep hanging out with people that you do work with or that kind of know the same uh, schedule. And then it is that, that cycle of just kind of keep going back and forth to, to everything that you do know and not being able to really enjoy um, a normal life. Interesting. Absolutely. I'm divorced. The only really poignant uh, relationship that I had or relationships I've had that were really close to very successful were because they're also in the industry. Mm, so there's, get a, it. there's a real connection and uh, a very deep understanding uh, of what I do for a living. Because mm -hmm. for a normal person, they're crazy. Yeah. They, they think Dating you're crazy. Dating is hard in this, yeah. for sure. It's so hard. You can't date. I've never dated someone I worked with in 35 years one thing I'm proud of is I you know was not the typical like oh he's dating and because in our and actually when and when I run a place I encourage them to date each other oh really oh yeah absolutely I broke every rule I tell yeah. them the we more you together. because where else are they going to find happiness uh, if she's working five days a week at Katana like she was and only has two days off that leaves her two days to have a social life to catch up with her family to do things that she wants to do and to try to date someone on only two days a week when yeah. then you're exhausted those two days you psychologically a switch goes off and says you say oh my god this is my weekend it's a sunday and a monday or a tuesday yep. and a wednesday and you're you're just like i don't want to do anything exactly i don't want to date uh oh, man i really like to have sex but i guess i'll just no time watch a movie instead <laughs> and eat some fattening food because you you find your happiness where you can when you can yeah. because it's such a sh small window mm -hmm. Um, so it, usually the only time it actually does, work. and then what I don't want, two people that work for me, a waiter and a chef or a line cook, uh, there's more problems caused by them trying to hide it than there are if you oh. actually let them be happy and thrive. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, it's true. Yeah. Uh, you know? That's it, interesting. I mean, it can go the other way though, too. That's what, when and you talked to me about like the drama. drama but that's what HR is for. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Right, but <laughs> I found that you know you, I'm a, I'm a realist. Yeah. You know you cannot work. You, you have to create a family environment. You have to create a, a, a happy, uh, productive environment. It's unrealistic to think that you can expect. I had 90 employees at Katana. It's unrealistic to expect when everybody's working full time, to not wind up. Uh, there's always alcohol afterwards for yeah. some small cliques or groups. I don't. Know. 
I don't want to say which. <laughs> Not group. me, never. But uh, you know, it, it's how can you do that? It's like being in the military. Uh, you're 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 kind of sequestered. You're in the trenches, working, doing it, and then when when you get liberty leave. You you fly your freak 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 flag and as you fly your freak flag, and you want to do it with the people that are closest to you because right. you have no other you have no other outlet. You can't, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's like a it's family hard. for sure. It's not just your coworkers. Like they really become some of your best friends. Like most of my best friends are from working different jobs, with different restaurant jobs, and and meeting them there, and then you just kind of stay friends forever yeah. after that because you understand each other too. You have the same. Um, you've had the same experiences. And so when people say like, oh, why don't you just go work over here, go work over there? I'm like, because the place I'm working, it is my family. When I'm not there, like the barbecue I had for my birthday, mm -hmm. most of those people All I've right. worked with before, whether yeah. it be my Becomes current job or last family. job. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So when you, even when things do happen, like during your shift where you yell at someone, you know, you're just high stress and something happens and you, you, you go, oh my God, like you just want to murder them. Two hours later, once you're closed, it's like nothing even happened. It's like, mm -hmm. hey man, do you want to grab a drink? Because you just know that in the heat of the moment, like that stuff happens, and that's why you have an even str a stronger connection outside of work too. It's because you're able to deal and with these super high, 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 emotional, stressful right. situations, and then turn around and and. Be and let's chill. go have a drink is the variable, because that's when you love someone like a sister, but then after a few drinks, they become your stepsister. <laughs> God. In the restaurant business. So, so I want to ask how how important. Um, is it to spend time with your coworkers outside of work? And this can this is applicable to any industry. So in the corporate financial world, absolutely not. But in the restaurant world, I, it creates a stronger bond. It creates a, a better synergy. It creates uh, who put this thing together? Glue. That's who. It's not me. It's not mm. uh, one person or owner or partner. It's the collective. Like the stronger you create that bond. Again, you have to understand you're dealing with some very sensitive things. You're dealing with uh, affecting people's emotions. You're dealing with food. Uh, you're, thing with, you're dealing with a product that people put in their mouth to change the way they feel right. and alcohol. And, you know, you're creating a memory and a memory uh, is pleasure. Like we only associate what's pleasurable with the memory of it. So with that being said, like it's, it's hugely important. Like I think any – and it doesn't – I don't think it's specific to – uh, the restaurant business. I think any small uh, business, I I don't think it works with large restaurant groups. But with small independent restaurants, absolutely. And if you can utilize that family, uh, that core uh, family team concept, which every corporation tries to do, it's all about the team. Mm -hmm. It's all about teamwork. Mm -hmm. It's about your pod, right? Like mm -hmm. here's a team of 50 people, but this is your pod. Mm -hmm. It's creating that unity, that that glue, that that uh, synergy between a small group of people. Now, when you have a small restaurant uh, under fifty seats, absolutely. If you have twelve to twenty-four people working for you, I did it with ninety people, and I think I did a really good job because, really, as a manager, all I'm ever thinking uh, as a manager is number one, try to get everybody to have the same motive. Mm. Uh, number two, try to keep everybody uh, from killing themselves or each other. Uh, and then number three, most importantly, you're just managing egos. Mm -hmm. Everybody has mm -hmm. ego. So if you can get them to uh, have the same motive, you alleviate a lot of the ego. Um, if one person, and I use this analogy too, like it, the three of us can be greedy. There's nothing wrong with greedy, but the minute one of us is selfish mm -hmm. is where that mantra breaks down. Like, let's all be greedy. We'll all make a lot of money. We'll all have fun doing it. We'll all make, if, if the goal is to be greedy oh. and make money and be productive and, and crush this business, great. But if we're greedy and she's selfish, she wants more than what you and I uh, agree upon is greedy, yeah. then it breaks down. So a, Yeah, so in that interview, initial interview, you're probably looking, there's like that selflessness gene that like, Absolutely. like to be part of something bigger than themselves. Absolutely. Right? She doesn't remember this, but I asked her to come in the morning. I always interview people in the morning because if you say nine or ten or eleven o'clock, I'm not gonna, oh. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna crap all over millennials or Gen Z. But if you ask, like I give you the the, the craziest thing I've ever heard is uh, at Katana, someone was supposed to show up uh, for an interview as a as a line cook, and he didn't show up. And I called him an hour after he was supposed to be there, and he answered the phone, and I was like, well, you know, 
I'm, I'm mistaken. Weren't you supposed to be here at 3 o'clock? It's 4.15. Oh, yeah, my bad, man. I'm like, well, what happened? Well, I Googled it and realized that you were more than a mile away from where I live. Oh, I live yeah. in Rogers Park. And I said, oh, okay, I still don't understand. Why didn't you? A, why didn't that warrant a respectful phone call to me saying you weren't going to make it? But what did it matter if it was more than, well, I'm trying to find a job that's within a mile of my house. So that's what we're dealing with. Okay. You know, like. <laughs> His yeah. loss. Yeah. Um, is there a conventional route to becoming a restaurateur? Yes. There is. Yes. Did you ever uh, see, uh, what is it, uh, National Lampoon's Vacation? With Chevy Christmas Chase? Vacation? Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever see Las Vegas? No. No. Uh, National Lampoon, uh, uh, Vegas. So... Uh, he's in the casino. Chevy Chase is in the casino with a guy, and he's like, he's like, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna gamble one hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars at the craft table. He goes, I got a better idea, and that's like when someone says they want to get in the restaurant. Oh, you're gonna put two million dollars. Here's what we do. I want you to come outside, bring the two and a half million dollars, uh, put it in a suitcase, hand it over to me. I'll kick you in the nuts, and we'll call it a day. The way to become a millionaire in the restaurant business is to start out as a multimillionaire. Oh, shit. Because you have to break, literally, I hate to use this pun, but you have to break a lot of eggs. It's a lot of trial and error. Unless you have, as especially now, like, to be a restaurateur, it's like a lot of chefs in the late 90s that try to open their own restaurant. If you're really great at cooking food and managing a kitchen, doesn't mean you're going to be a successful Ooh, restaurateur. Okay. Because you have to be, you have to have a strong sense of how to read a P&L. Uh, uh, vendor management, uh, managing the cost of goods in your kitchen, managing the labor in your kitchen, and actually cooking, executing a, a well thought out menu that's actually going to move. That's great as a chef. Uh, on the same side, on the other side of the coin, same with a, an operator. Just because you're a great manager doesn't mean that you can open a restaurant and say, oh, I'm just going to hire a cook and tell him what to do. And there's so many different uh, plates that you have to spin now. So to be a restaur restaurant too, I think. It helps if you start in the mail room, you start out as a dishwasher, and you do as much as you can. You look at the most successful restaurateurs, they all started out somewhere mopping floors, mm. being a dishwasher, working the line. Um, one of my f favorite stories is the uh, is the chef owner of Uchi in, in uh, Austin. Uh, his girlfriend was going to kick him out because he was a ne'er-do-well, and she said, I'm going to break up with you unless you find a job. So he literally did what most young men do that get pressure from the girlfriend he literally just went a block away went to the dry cleaner went to the grocery store went like down the street to the sushi restaurant and they made him a dishwasher well eight years later he wound up owning the restaurant now he's one of the best sushi chefs and most preeminent restaurants uh you know most okay times. so you have to start out at the bottom. It's, everybody wants a instant gratification because that's the culture we live in. It's a disposal. It's not getting what you want. It's wanting it once you get it. Like you can get anything. You know, uh, my best friend's partner uh, did a podcast and he was talking about Chicago. Do you know how amazing Chicago is? Like, yeah. Uh, were you like, born and raised here? No. Suburbs. You can come to Chicago yeah. Yeah. and it'll, it'll, it'll love you. It'll love you as much as you love it. It'll give back to you as much as you give. Chicago. In other words, you can move from anywhere in the planet, come to Chicago, and if you work hard, you have a goal, and you set your mind to it, you can have a car, you can have a job, you can have an apartment. And if you want to open a restaurant one day, if you do what it takes, uh, go work at Let Us Entertain You, go work for Boca, go work for One Off, and work your ass off and do everything you can, you will meet the investors in the restaurant you work at because they see how hard and how conscientious and how diligent you're working. You will meet an investor, whether they see that or not, dining at the restaurant. Lightning will strike. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll strike up a conversation with someone that sees the value of what you do and how you do it. And there's always someone willing to pay a fee uh, for someone that's mastered something. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that for a fact mm -hmm. because uh, that's how I've achieved and uh, acquired the, the pool of investors that I've gotten. The people that support and believe in me not the concept not a restaurant is a business they all know it's not a big payoff and mm -hmm. a, a slow grind to get your money back but they believe in me and so really what it all comes down to if you want to be a restaurateur i guess the bottom line is you really have to have 
an amazing sense of believing in yourself because there's no harder business. So master your craft and yeah. the money will come. Absolutely. That's amazing. What's next for you guys? Aaliyah? Yeah. I don't know what's next for let's, you. Let's not ask me that. No? So let's go to Jason Travel. for that Travel one. the world Travel. and never come back? She's a traveler. That's <laughs> always been my, my goal, yes. I mean, I started off in this industry as at 17 kind of working in order to travel and i mean i still do that t to some degree um, i'm always thinking about where i'm going next um but f i always come back to this industry because there's something that i love about it and there's something that is addicting about it and every time i i think about leaving and try try to try to leave i'm like this sounds terrible going going somewhere else and and having that that life like yes there's pros and cons but like and at the end of the day it it's the family that I that I want, the friends that I want, and it has the freedom as well. That it's a skill set that you can need. take anywhere, actually, though. Yeah, you know? absolutely. It's like we were applicable. talking about earlier, like the people skills that you gain from this and mm -hmm. the your ability to small talk, unmatched. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. What about you, Jason? What's next? Um, <clears throat> you know, when I left Katana over a year ago, I left uh, literally 14 months ago. Okay. Uh, I went on vacation for two months okay because i literally worked every day mm -hmm. i never took a day off i would leave early if there was on like 120 150 reservations or less but i i went because my partners you know uh kind of made me the face plate and gave me a piece of the place and made me partners in their concept in chicago um they'd always done profit sharing with their gms but they never actually made someone a regional you know director of operate because they were planning on moving you know they're going to open another brand here and oh, okay. move, move east so I, when I don't know what to do, uh, I do nothing. And I figured I deserved a vacation, so I traveled. My best friend was engaged at the time and living, uh, staying at his fiance's house in, in uh, North Miami, so I stayed with him. I went to New York to visit my best friend. I went to California to visit my, uh, my mentor, and I, I went to North Carolina to visit my extended family. And then I hopped around and ate and drank, and then I broke up with my girlfriend. And then my dog died. And then I moved. Like, you know, it was yeah. like uh, out of a movie. And, you know, it's a life of extremes in the restaurant business. And I'm certainly, uh, you know, a prime example of extremes. So I took uh, a very long, hard, deep, I rolled up my sleeve and took a lot of deep introspection of what I wanted to do because I knew that whatever I did next, um, would have to make me happy because I'd rather, and I think that's why I'm kind of a success in this business is that I'd rather be happy than right. So I'm not looking to do whatever it says, oh, well, this is the right thing you have to do or this is the right thing you should do. I operate on, I don't have an ego, so I kind of want to learn something. I've only had two passions for 35 years, the restaurant hospitality, food and beverage business, and martial arts. So I thought at this point at 53 years old, Maybe I should listen to my mom and be a chiropractor. No, just <laughs> uh, I thought I should go into something like what I've always excelled at in the restaurant space is hospitality. So I thought, well, hotels are hospitality. So maybe I should venture into working at a hotel because I would like to open a small boutique hotel mm. uh, or bed and breakfast in Chicago mm. and really crush it and make it something unique. Uh, but also have that list of 50 things not to do if I open up. A miniature Soho house, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, the other thing I thought of uh, doing was becoming an employee again. Because what I really want to do is, like, I think the moment you tell yourself, oh, I've, I'm, the, I'm great at this and I've done everything, that's when you're kind of a turd in my eyes. Like, oh, that guy's a douchebag. When you you're too me. good, yeah. So I want to kind of start all over it and I want to be an employee again. Whether it's in a, a there's a, there's a, very famous, well-known hotel that's going to be opening up, and I've applied uh, here for a job. Out? Yeah, okay. and I said I don't care what I do. Uh, you can put me uh, in the realm of what I know. Like make me. Uh, you can make me the major d of the restaurant. You know, uh, you can uh, put me uh, as the manager of the rooftop, uh, front desk, whatever. I would like to learn something new because it still involves hospitality, which I. I, I, th I love yeah. and can do naturally. But then I kept thinking maybe there's something I need to do that's outside uh, the wheelhouse of hospitality and martial arts. So I'm exploring a couple things. Acting is one of them because it's kind of fallen in my lap without me trying to audition or trying to go uh, to castings. It's I, I've been really blessed and lucky uh, that it 
miraculously somehow it just falls in my lap. So that's one venue, and I've had a lot of amazing opportunities to pursue acting. It would involve me traveling to the East Coast and West Coast for small bits, but mm -hmm. I don't mind doing that. Uh, I'm just literally in a point right now where I'm trying to figure out what my next move is, and I'm taking a really long, careful look inside of what I want to do because, like I said, I don't have an ego, and I know that what's gotten me to the place I like, The reason I'm such a great operator owner is because I was such, I think, an exemplary employee. I was never late. I never called in sick. I did everything for my boss and my fellow uh, co-workers and my guests, whether I was a bartender, a waiter, a manager, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna apply that same focused discipline to whatever I do next. That's amazing. Um, I'm 53 years old right now, so I'm trying to figure out what I do for the next 15 to 20 years. It has to be something that's really fulfilling uh, my soul instead of my pocket. Um, yeah. Even though that's. But I'm sure it would at the beginning. That's I mean, unrealistic because you need money to pay your bills <laughs> and to live. Uh, thank right. God I've, I'm in a great situation right now with the group of friends and family and uh, you know the people that are around me right now. They're always they don't judge me. They love me unconditionally, and everybody's been amazing, including my best friends. Uh, and it's not a big secret who my best friends are. She knows who they are. They're all in the industry. They're all high level in the industry. Um, director of operations, chefs, the whole nine yards, and they've all, you know, I've, I, I, when you don't know what to do, you don't do anything, you absorb everything, and so that you can, I've never been someone that was uh, strategic. I've always been tactical. Like, mm. I think on my feet, I jump, I react, I don't think about things. And so for the first time in my life, I'm trying to Good for you. think about things. Slow be, it down. Be strategic, yeah. Yeah. But you're not, you're not, at the same time, you're not slowing down because you just, you're always, it's something I'm new. I'm keeping you know? busy. Right. Yeah. Right, right. I'm doing things to keep me happy to still, I, I did two consulting uh, gigs that are, they're crushing it and doing uh, extremely well. Uh, I'm also doing, I can speak of one thing that I'm doing that I'm going to put out there. It's, uh, it's something really, uh, to me, it's something really innovative. It's kind of retro, but in a new cutting edge way. So there is a place called St. Emmerich. Okay. And what it is, is a amazingly designed pop-up restaurant space. And what it is, it's going to be an incubator and a, a restaurant, kind of like a rogue uh, outlaw restaurant space where guest chefs from all over the world oh. i will i will reach out to them through social media through emails or my personal connection with them and say hey uh, i know a chef in new york that is an amazing he's probably to me the best sushi chef in the united states he's uh got his own omakase restaurant in new york uh we're personal friends we've been friends for 20 years i'm going to ask him to be the first guest uh, of mine That's at amazing. the pop-up space. So, cool so there was a restaurant called Trio at Evanston, and it's you know it's very well known. Uh, Henry uh, ran the place and owned the place in uh, in this small uh, hotel in Evanston, and it was in the lobby. And some of the chefs there were Dale Levitsky, Sean McLean, uh, Grant Ackett's, uh Rick Tremonto. So yeah. it was kind of the place. It's like next. Okay. In a sense, it was like the, it was the precursor for next. Okay. So every every two three years, it would have a different chef. But that was literally the launching pad for that chef for becoming the next big Chicago chef. So what we want to do is uh, uh, with these uh, these two people that I partnered up with, I'm essentially going to be the uh, curator director of this yeah. uh, pop up space, and what we'll be doing is hosting chefs from all over the world. It's kind of um, like traveling tattoo artists in a way. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's that. funny because my best friend who did all my tattoos, she's the one that introduced me. She, oh. Her and a collective group of her creatives designed space. Oh, so it's amazing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. And it's called St. Emmerich. Okay. And it's in the most, it's kind of a, you have to see it to believe it kind of space. You know, in the last podcast, the Alpha Hippie podcast, you, got, you mentioned um how you can go to any any neighborhood it doesn't have, even have to have a sign it could be have a red door but people are seeking adventure well and experience i think that's what you know the restaurant business is all about especially now um and i can i can speak from experience because jerry kleiner opened vivo in 1990 end of 1990 and he opened it in um the west loop now you look at west loop now 
Right, when I lived in West Loop in 1987, there was nine people living in West Loop. Oh. So there's only one loft building that you could rent. <laughs> there was only one loft building that you could rent apartments from. It was called New Management. It was their first building. There was nine loft apartments. I paid six hundred dollars for twenty two hundred square foot loft. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> and Michael Bladder, who managed the shelter, lived there. Al Ford, who was a very famous photographer, oh, wow. uh, lived there. Phil and Flash, who was a rock and roll nightlife photographer, lived there. Um, uh, it was a mixed bag of nuts. It was just all of us living and pioneering this neighborhood. And then now, fast forward. Uh, 30 years later, it's the most Tony neighborhood in Chicago. It's the equivalent of Chelsea or Soho, uh, our, ch our Chelsea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's restaurant corridor represents some of the best restaurants in Chicago or certainly some of the most right. uh, affluent and, and, you know, the Google building, all this stuff. So uh, for me, um, it's it's been a it's been a huge uh cyclical yeah it's uh, come journey. full circle yeah. it, it has it's that's ridiculous amazing. well thank you guys i mean that's all uh, all i had awesome yeah you guys good Any, anything you want i mean i want to impart on the on the world while you have the mic your oh, no. good, good? Uh, <laughs> what's your favorite uh restaurant oh favorite restaurant favorite restaurant i don't I don't know if I have a... F I've never been to any of the, like, Alin Alinea's or, or Next or anything like that. Um, last restaurant I went to, I love going to a Mediterranean spot called Larsa's in Skokie. Don't I used dine to, like, in Skokie a lot. Don't dine in Skokie a lot? Mm. I used to... You know, I grew up in Rogers Park, so I used to, but not recently. Um, uh, Pita Inn? Well, see, and then the Russian uh, yeah. Zhivago or uh, yeah, Pita and is like yeah. oh, it's a good go to. Yeah, but and Lars is more of a sit down, sit down than, than that. What's so, your favorite restaurant? Man. I don't have time to go out to restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> I work too much. <laughs> I kind of lost track of my story for West Loop. What was the original question you asked me when I started going on that tangent with the West Loop? I don't even know. I don't know either because I, mean, I kind of lost. Uh, I kind of lost. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, all, all Cheval's great, but like if I'm in the mood for a big. We, we, Aaliyah came out to. We went to all, Small Cheval the other night. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. Go to uh, Cafe Marie Jean. Oh, where's this? Oh, yes. Cafe That's got Marie the Jean. best burger in my uh, book. And then. How do you spell uh, that? Loyalist. Loyalist is underneath Smith, which is a Michelin rated. Okay. Uh, Alinea Ellum uh, opened the restaurant with his wife, and it's amazing. It's uh, Okay. They got voted the best burger by. Um, oh. Interesting. Gourmet or food and wine or both probably, but it's my second favorite. I go back and forth. I ping pong between you live there. those two places. Yeah. Oh, this whole body's body by burgers. Body by burgers. Yeah. How do you think it? It's doable. Tequila. Trademark. And te <laughs> tequila's probiotic. You lose hey, weight if you, you drink it. It's like eating celery. <laughs> <laughs> Negative calories. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for spending the time. Pleasure. To, quite uh, quite the legacy, Jason. Um, and we're keen only to... in my own mind. Oh, no. I don't think and so. I think you're... <laughs> Your work speaks volumes. Yes. Well, you know what? Uh, the only uh, if there's one thing that um, uh, that I'd like to be known for is that not the guests, but the people I work for that I affected them in a, in a way that's memorable. Yeah, and, and I'm really proud of that because everybody I've ever worked for, when you know, who knows, two years from now after she's done traveling and I open, I have a restaurant. I'm gonna ask her to come exactly. work with me, and chances are she will. Because she knows I'm going to treat her right, and I'm going to make sure, worry about her, whether or not she's going to uh, have a livelihood and make enough money right, to do right. it. And I would never, you know, say, you have to come work for me. But, right, right. you know, I, I wouldn't even, she knows I wouldn't even ask her unless I set it up so that she knows she would be very profitable and happy and create a safe environment. Right. I, just like you trying to seek out the hotel industry, I think you, you're at that point where uh, maybe I, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but like where people want to work with you just to learn, just to just to be around you, maybe. For sure. sure. Perhaps his right? name comes with a, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Working working for him, no matter even what the concept is, yeah. people go into it knowing That's his name too good, and yeah. knowing what reputation he has. Right. Um, that makes me really happy. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I love you. Oh man. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Um, for Absolutely. those, stay in tune. Um, Abba Aloha, stay curious. I'll see you in the next episode. All right, that's it. Awesome. Can I snap a quick pic of you? Of course. Oh, Absolutely. Whew. That was awesome. Oh, yeah. that Great was job, so, Jason. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>